and it's my pleasure now to introduce the next speakers, which are uh, Guillaume Carradino and Elodie Chabrol. And they will be speaking to us about from science festivals to institutional projects, the case for a grassroots approach. Um, so Elodie will be going first and uh, Elodie has a background uh, or a PhD in neurogenetics. And she's currently the international director of the Pint of Science Festival and also a freelance uh, science communicator. Um, Guillaume has a background in political sciences and he co-founded uh, two organizations dedicated to science outreach the Belgian chapter of the Pint of Science Festival and Beyond Research. And we are very excited to hear from both of you. So the floor is yours, Elodie. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, um, welcome. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I wanted to start saying that I will talk first and then Guillaume's going to talk. Um, so if you have questions, we might keep them for later to be sure uh, we're going to have enough time uh, for Guillaume to to talk about everything. Um, also, we are both going to talk about Pint of Science, um, so we might have some details that Guillaume might share um, more than me or a bit better than me. Um, so as you said, my background is neurogenetics, so um, I have a PhD in neurogenetics and then I did a postdoc, two postdocs actually. Um, so I was a researcher while um, I, I jumped in Pint of Science in 2013. Um, so my job is going to be uh, introducing uh, Pint of Science to you guys, um, showing you a bit what it is about, uh, what we do um, at the international level, mostly. Um, so Pint of Science, I don't know if you've all heard of it, I've seen uh, the little logo. Um, the next time is going to be in May 2021, so um, in two months. You can follow us on social media, every country has a different uh, sorry, I don't know why it didn't work. Uh, every country has different accounts and we have an international one. Um, so the idea of Pint of Science, it really, it was created in 2013 and um, it was created by uh, two founders, uh, Misha Motkin and Pravin Paul. And the idea was, they were scientists, they received people in the lab and they realized how complicated it was to actually get people in the lab, but they also realized how people enjoyed um, meeting scientists and they thought why not bringing instead of bringing people to the lab bring the lab to people and obviously it was in UK uh, when you think about meeting people it's in the pub um, for the very nice feeling of being home you know the pub in UK is really like a second home you're there sure to drink with your friend but you're also there when it's really rainy on a Sunday and you want to play games with uh, your family or your your friends as well so it's really a place where um, you know you're relaxed and you can talk about everything so the idea was to move that to uh, to the pub obviously it's not brand new you know it's been decades or even centuries, science is discussed um, in bars. But what we decided is to do it as a festival. So UK is very strong on festivals, um, especially music festivals. And the idea of Pint of Science was based like a music festival. Let's have multiple stages at the same time in lots of different places. So we started with Swiss cities in 2013, which seems a world away, but it wasn't that long. Actually, it's only eight years ago. Uh, so it's going to be the ninth kind of science this year. Uh, it was London, Oxford, and Cambridge, and the idea was really to have uh, people talking in the in the pub um, about lots of different things. So first, you see on the slide, this is Barney, the logo that didn't look like that actually the first time. He didn't have his glasses, and he looked really freaky, uh, like purely like a brain um, in a in a pint. Um, so the concept of Find the Sense, as I told you, um, it's really people in bars, pub, cafe, public places, um, more with more and more countries joining. Sometimes it's diversifying as well. Um, it could be um, cafe of libraries. Um, as soon as it's a nice, cozy place, basically you you find Find the Sense. Uh, it's not just French pictures. You have some of the French. You have some others um, like Canadian and everything. Um, so the idea is science is in the pubs. So we have amazing speakers um, that are usually either stressed by the fact of being in the pub or very relaxed because they are in the pub. It really depends on the people. It depends on their experiences as well. Um, but they usually have a really good time. And uh, we're always grateful because they have so much fun with us that it's really nice to watch. 
Um, it's based also on a huge network of volunteers. So Find of Science just hit 30 countries actually this week. Um, so it means 30 countries with something like 600 cities. Uh, in every city, we have a lots of people organizing the teams. I think we're close. We never really know the number of volunteers in the world, but it's close to 5,000 something or even like probably a bit more. Um, so it's amazing volunteers that are organizing the evening. So you have lots of pictures from uh, everywhere. We have Berlin, um, so we have Germany, Canada, uh, UK, France as well. Um, and so we're super grateful because without them, we wouldn't have find of science and we wouldn't have expanded that that much because every year is just exploding. I will, I will show you um, very soon. And as I told you, really the idea of find of science, um, and I think it's the most important uh, part of it is that it's, it's simultaneous. So you have tons of different uh, countries and cities having events at the same time. So obviously with the time difference, uh, it's not exactly the same time for everyone, but it's during the same three days. So what happens during Pint of Sense when we are in bars normally um, is that we start and with, uh, we're starting with New Zealand uh, and Australia and we're finishing with Costa Rica. So during the for European countries, um, during the festival, it's starting at nine in the morning and finishing at five in the morning. And then we do it again and and like that for three for three days um so if, if you follow on social media you're basically flooded with images of uh, people in in pubs uh, watching science and i love it because um when I, I look at all the social media to be honest i can barely differentiate the evenings and it's really good because it really means the the format is really replicated everywhere the same um so i put you i put some pictures for you of uh, different places and to be honest, if I don't have the countries named, uh, it's really hard um, to, to really guess. Usually, um, I don't know if I have Greece, but usually Greece has like has some really pretty bars and really nice pictures on the beach. So we know it's Greece. <laughs> Belgium has amazing breweries like you can see at the bottom. So we usually know it's Belgium and I'm always super uh, jealous of the, the places you get Guillaume actually. <laughs> For pints of science but um, if you look around it's really uh, mostly looking the same people having fun in 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 uh, bars or cafe or, or pubs um, listening to scientists talking about about science uh, i put a very parisian <laughs> picture at the top uh, which was taken during pint of science it's a very uh, very parisian brasserie <laughs> it's not just french but very parisian but um you have lots of different um Places like Mexico can do it outside, Greece can do it outside as well. Everyone's doing with their specificities of their country, but um, during three nights, it's, it's mostly the same nights everywhere. Um, some people ask me sometimes if it's the same evening that is, uh, you know, played online on a screen, but it's every place has a special different events. And even in some cities, you have several, um, several events at the same time as well. So it's really completely different. Uh, wherever you go, we have different themes, but Guillaume is gonna talk about that. Um, and this is Pint of Science since uh, 2014 to show you how it expanded. Um, so you have the map of uh, 2019, actually the last time we could actually go <laughs> in bars. Um, and you can see how it expanded from uh, 2014 Actually, 2013 was the first time in three different countries. Um, 2014, sorry, there is like a little uh, mistake with the, with the thing, but 2014 um, had six countries. 15, we had nine. Tw uh, 16, we had 12. Uh, 17, we had 10. 18, this is the year I started as a <laughs> international director because um, until 2017, 2018, everyone was doing it as a volunteer and it was really hard to help new countries. Um, starts Pint of Science. So this is when I decided to actually leave research and do Pint of Science. Um, at that time, it was some of kind of full-time um, country um, international director to help the new countries. And actually, this is at that time then Pint of Science Belgium um, started. Um, it was really good before, but it was really a struggle to have time to help new countries uh, properly, you know, because uh, most of the, the, the volunteers, they are not 
used to do science events or science communication. So we really train them from the start. And when I take on a new country, I really talk uh, about everything, you know, I try to train them in everything, every aspect. Um, I, I give them information about like how to, how to organize the event, but also how to communicate about the event on social media, uh, how to deal with the volunteers and everything. Um, so it takes quite a lot of, of time. So that's why we were restricted before. And in 2018, it was like the crazy year, as we call it. Um, then 19, 24 countries, um, and then we are 30, finally in 2021, but um, it's been two years we're doing it online now. Um, it was, it was a, a crazy ride, but I think most of the countries, they managed to actually turn it to online, which is not the DNA of Find of Science. It is nice to do online, but for sure, um, the DNA of Find of Science is um, meeting scientists, you know, um, being in the same room, uh, having the same cozy atmosphere, so online is, is good for now, but um, we can't wait to go back um, in pubs. And this is the map for 2021. And, ah, uh, yes, actually, uh, if I, yeah, if I have time, uh, I wanted to prepare just a few quotes because um, we've done a, a international feedback to know uh, what people think of Find of Science a bit everywhere, you know, to have uh, voices in, in all the countries uh, for the organizers, but also for the attendees and the speakers. Um, and I, I, I picked three of them that I really liked. Um, the first one is from an organizer in, in Italy that said, um, that, sorry, I have too many windows everywhere. <laughs> it's really hard to see my screen. Um, that she said, I was in another festival, not scientific, but some people in the street saw her t shirt and said, Paint of Science was the best festival in our life. So I think for the organizers, it's really nice to take part uh, in Paint of Science because they get a training, uh, they get an experience, but also they get a very cool moment um, of joining that. And in France, I, I love how all the organizers are always. Um, you know, almost not believing people are there at their event and it's people they don't know. You know, that's always where they tell me, they're like, look at those people, we don't know them and they're here, it's so nice. So it is lots of work, but it's amazing to see uh, actual people you don't know showing up at your event. Um, for the speakers as well, uh, which is fun, is that often we hear that um, for them, it was nice to see their science in a different angle. Uh, but we've seen this, um, this feedback from a speaker in Greece that said that he established collaboration with scientists who actually attended the festival. And it's the first time in 10 years they met them. Um, they were always collaborating via email, but it was the first time they could actually meet. So it's quite, it's quite a funny, interesting feedback to think that you, know, you had to actually take your science to the pub to actually meet the people you're working with. Um, and one last um, feedback that was from an attendee in Switzerland that I found really nice um, was uh, from someone that said everybody was so friendly despite being a high school student, uh, she felt really accepted and she was able to talk with everyone. And that's really the point of Find of Science is to be there and to be able to ask questions and to feel like not judged to ask any kind of questions to the organizers, to the, the scientists. Um, and that's really what we want uh, for people to feel like, uh, like they are safe and they can, they can ask anything about the science or about, um, I, we get lots of personal questions to the speaker to know how uh, they work, to know why they worked on that subject specifically. Um, so I think that's really my, my favorite part um, in Pine Science. It's the personal, uh, feeling and the personal question that people get is not just about the science, it's about the scientists um, as well and meeting the scientists. And that's it for me. Uh, so I will, I will let uh, Guillaume speak now. Right, thank you, Elodie. <laughs> um, I'm going to find my slides. <laughs> Your slides are way prettier than mine, actually. Well done. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Um, but what I can say it's uh, indeed is very inclusive. I mean, um, I'm one of the only uh, volunteers in Belgium who is not a scientist, and I also feel accepted by the others. Uh, <laughs> everybody's very nice. Okay, um, so I think my screen is now everywhere. So I'm going to continue with uh, an insight into Pint of Science in Belgium. So concretely, how it happens. Um, right. So. 
uh, because it's OpenMR Benelux, I, I felt compelled to show the map also of uh, our friends from the Netherlands. Uh, the tulips and the windmills are from them. I took it from their website. Uh, they like to entertain stereotypes, so let, let's, uh, <laughs> let's accept it. Um, on the left, you see the map of Belgium uh, with all the cities that have been participating in the festival so far. So uh, it should be 14, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, and as Elodie was saying, we all have all different uh, identity and website and social media accounts. And you can see that because, as you can see, I'm using a completely different layout for my presentation. <laughs> this is the layout for this year's festival. We, we have a different visual identity and uh, every country is welcome to, um, to, to be creative in that way. Um, and as you can see here, we have also different websites. So if you want to learn about uh, a pound of sense in the Netherlands, uh, visit the website. You see all the cities where they are very active and same for Belgium. Um, just to give you more details on who is really behind um, uh, Pint of Sense Belgium, which is um, a legal entity by itself, so every country is a legal entity. So here, uh, we're all volunteers. Um, we are a non-profit association and we have two types of partners. So the main partner we have is actually uh, um, uh, the innovation agency in Brussels, who is providing some very welcome subsidies. Um, they are the only ones who are providing subsidies. Sometimes we have occasional grants by um, uh, private companies, but it's very lim it's limited to specific events. Uh, but in general, this is how we work. So on the left, you have the, the main um, uh, source of funding. And on the right, you have um, a lot of organizations that are, I, I like to call it in-kind partners, meaning that they, they help us either co-organize events or communicate about the festival, or they, they get involved in the organization or the planning, or they relay some information. So uh, they have been around from the beginning, from 27, 2018. Uh, they're all very friendly, and uh, we are very happy to, um, to collaborate with them whenever we have the chance. So as you can see, the, the main universities in Belgium are there. Um, and now to give you some figures for Belgium only, um, as you can see, we started in 2018. Um, so for the first year, we managed to be present in eight cities and to bring uh, 1,400 participants. Uh, and we had zero budget. Uh, so it's really grassroots in the sense that uh, it's grassroots. There is no one providing money to organize things for anybody. We do it because we like it and we do it on our own uh, free time. And this is a pretty amazing result uh, that we achieved thanks to our volunteers. And in 2019, only one year after, uh, we were in, uh, in uh, 12 cities um, and we organized 67 events. What is interesting here is the number of speakers. You can see the first year it was 94 and the second year it was 150. And I haven't realized this, the, the, the scale of this until uh, I started to put together figures for LOD because LOD is compiling uh, statistics from everybody. Uh, and when I saw that, I triple checked because it's, it's amazingly high and I don't recall uh, I, I, didn't, I did not realize how many speakers were actually involved, and it's pretty huge. So there is a lot of interest. You can just see that by the numbers. A lot of interest from researchers and scientists around the country to just uh, share their passions, share their work. Um, and in only, only two years, uh, this is an amazing result. And I should try to calculate how many years it will take until we have all the researchers in Belgium. <laughs> Uh, in the festival. Uh, 2020 is a bit special, so we don't like to talk about it so much. Uh, as you can imagine, the numbers are a bit um, all around the place. Uh, we did manage to have a couple of uh, in-person events and uh, a few online events, and it's going to be, well, in 2021, it's going to be fully online. Hopefully, 2022 will uh, um, go back to, to the positive trend that we've seen in the 18 and 19 years. We also do special events outside of the festival, which uh, Elodie hasn't mentioned because it's not part of the, of the identity of the festival itself, but uh, in, in Belgium and uh, at least in other countries, we also have special activities. For example, um, once a year, we normally do a special uh, Valentine's Day event where we have a speed dating with scientists. Um, and it's also very well attended and uh, everybody's always happy to, uh, to attend these events. Um, she mentioned some themes, so I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of what it means. Basically, every country, and so including Belgium, uh, we uh, put all the, 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 the subjects of our events, we put them in categories that are the same for everybody. So we have the category Beautiful Mind, which, which includes everything from neuroscience to psychiatry. Atoms to Galaxies, which is one of the most popular themes, of course, including physics, chemistry, math, and astronomy. Um, our body. 
um, which is probably more interesting for you guys. It's about medicine, human biology, and health. Uh, planet Earth, environment, geosciences, then take me out, our society, and creative reactions. So it's grouped by themes, and it allows to communicate about the festival in, in, a, in a better way, and standardized way. Um, so it's good that we all use the same approach. And on the right here, you see a very practically uh, a typical event. So how it goes for uh, a Pint of Science night is um, two speakers. Sometimes you can have one, you can have three, you can deviate from the standard approach. But the standard approach is uh, short talks of uh, 15 to 20 minutes each, accessible to everybody in a bar and in between an, a break and a nice interactive activity, whether it's a game or uh, um, an artist performing a song um, or an experiment whatever but people need to be engaged and after the second talk uh, of course there is always q a and what what we like to do is to make sure that the speakers stay for at least another half an hour or one hour in the bar chatting with the people and it happens a lot usually people just have to leave because they have to, to catch a train or last metro but uh, that's the spirit of point of science people really enjoy uh, keeping the discussion going um the main difference with other initiative that uh, researchers or more familiar with is uh, that Pant of Science is, is on the informal spectrum uh, of things. So um, it's somewhere between how you explain your work to your mom, uh, which I always found challenging, even though I'm not a scientist, and, and, a, and a TED conference, which is still formal in a way, but it's, it's much more professional. So Pant of Science is somewhere in between. And it's also why it's, it's easy for scientists to get into that and for people to also um, absorb the, the knowledge. In Belgium, the audience that we have is very similar, I think, to what we can find in other countries, uh, I guess. Uh, yep. So we have all a very broad range of ages. We have uh, children, we have um, much more senior people, but the majority, I think it's around 25 to 35 years old. Um, we have a lot of people with a scientific background coming to our events, but not in the topic of the event. So that's quite interesting because people want to learn about other things. Um, and the number of people with no scientific background is, is growing year after year. It, it takes time. Um, in our team, most of the volunteers are a scientist. I'm one of the exceptions. So um, yeah, they really like to share their, their passion. How it happens, uh, basically, it's all the work of the volunteers. It's all the team. So you can see here the, the typical structure that we have in Belgium. We have a central team, which is essentially uh, me and a couple of other people. And we take care of the administration. We take care of the communication at, at national level, some fundraising partnership. But the actual development of the program, so who decides uh, who's going to speak and where and uh, how to get the bar and everything, it's all done by the teams locally. So every city has a team with a coordinator and a group of event organizers, and they are responsible for all of that. So it's really a bottom-up approach. Um, and that's why sometimes we have people who say, I would like to speak to, to one of your events. And sometimes we just say, well, why not? But you know, it's, it's up to the volunteers. It's not up to me to push it. Uh, so that's something we sometimes have to explain. How to get involved and how what, what it could mean for, for you if you're a scientist. Um, so why getting involved in the festival, uh, such as Plant of Science or other initiatives? Of course, uh, we're not the only ones uh, doing science cafes. Um, uh, what is special, as Elodie said, is that we do it at a massive scale simultaneously, but the format is not, nothing new. So why, uh, of course, promoting your research uh, outside of the of your usual uh, circles? You might also want to use Pint of Science to build up your science communication skills. As I said, it's a bit, it's a bit more informal than a TEDx, so you don't need to be a, a rock star to, to go on stage and talk. You can just do what you can, and, and usually it goes very well. Uh, you might also just want to socialize, uh, but at the same time do something useful for your project or for, for, for society in general by sharing knowledge. That's always good. Or simply you want to share your passion, and these are all good reasons to be involved in Pint of Science. And the different ways to be involved. Uh, so if you want simply to share your research, but you don't have time to do anything more, then you, you can try to participate as a speaker. But as I said, uh, there is, we have a database where you can sign up and, 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 and then you have uh, your name is accessible to all the volunteers. Um, but at the end of the day, the volunteers are going to choose uh, who is uh, speaking. Uh, you can also choose to volunteer directly and, and try to co-develop the program with others. You can also speak if you're a volunteer. There is no, you know, it's not uh, forbidden. 
so we have some volunteers who who volunteer, but they also they also give talks uh, to some events. You can also be a partner. So meaning, if you're an organization, you might not want to be uh, individually a volunteer, but you might want to co-organize uh, some events. Uh, or to completely organize an event by yourself in the framework of the festival. So we do it, for example, with the Flemish Mar Marine Institute in Ostend, they, they, or in Liège, with, uh, with the University of Liège. They completely organize events by themselves uh, within the framework of the festival with our standard format, uh, and, and it goes uh, very well. So they, we have very good uh, collaboration there, and it's, it's possible to do that too. Now, um, I will move to the topic of how you can make use of this if you have, um, let's say, a public funded project. And I'm going to tell you why I, I mentioned this topic. It's because in, uh, before I got involved in part of science, I've spent 10 years working in European funded projects, research projects. And my role was to, to lead and coordinate the uh, uh, dissemination and outreach and exploitation of the results of the research. And I never managed to do anything close to pan what Pant of Science is doing or any other initiative that you've heard about today. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this. So together with LOD, we, we try to get out of the um, Pant of Science um, a bubble and see what we can do to bridge the gap between these great initiatives that are really on the ground and the institutional uh, projects. So we created Beyond Research a few months ago, so it's very new. And the idea was to address the, the problem that uh, arises from the existence of two different mindsets. So if you think of Pint of Science or um, podcast or any grassroots or uh, bottom-up organization that is doing science communication for, for the fun of it, they, the state of mind is, I want. I want to do something. I want to talk about this. I want to organize or to create a YouTube channel. I want, I want, I want. But on the other side, if you, if you are in a university and you're involved in a, in a public funded project, whether it's European or, or, or national, uh, often you have a contract and you have things to deliver. So you're more into a, a, a need mindset. You know, I need to share my specific work. I need to fulfill my contract. And these two things rarely interact very well together, these two mindsets. So with Beyond Research, we try to bring the two worlds together uh, because we have the background from Path of Science. Uh, Elodie has a background from the research side and she's also a science communicator uh, professional, professionally. And I've been working many years in a uh, European uh, funded project. So we try to, to find a common ground there. And so we created the nonprofit, which is called Beyond Research. And Beyond Research aims to support the research outreach and engagement um, of, for research innovation projects to achieve greater impact and stimulate uh, a foster collaboration and acceptance among the stakeholders. So it's kind of blah, blah, blah you find in uh, European uh, programs where they always want you to achieve this. But we, we, the way we approach that is first from a nonprofit point of view, because there are many organizations that are providing these kind of things uh, very well and they've been there for many years but what we try to do here is to bring the grassroots directly into this sort of organization that is supporting the institutional project so it's it's more taking a proactive approach to to this topic i'm almost running out of time so i will i will uh, <laughs> speed up uh so these are basically the things that we that we can do, that we do at beyond research so we we can help with uh, training of researchers we can help defining outreach and dissemination strategies we can help organizing and structuring stakeholder engagement and soon we will launch um, a podcast on european funded projects themselves so that's a big challenge because it's usually very boring for the reasons i mentioned before uh, you know all this contractual framework that you have to take into account we'll try to make it more accessible so that's uh, one of the projects in the pipeline um, now a specific case when you have a public funded project and here i'm taking the case of a european project you have to have a certain set of activities. You have to have a communication and outreach strategy. You have to have stakeholder engagement strategy. You have to have a dissemination and capacity building strategy, or at least dissemination. And you have to have an exploitation strategy. So if you're not familiar with that, well, you know what communication is. Stakeholder engagement, I'm sure you can guess what it is. But dissemination and exploitation are slightly separate and different things. 
dissemination is is sharing the actual knowledge so you train people or you you publish uh papers in the scientific journals you go to scientific conferences um so you deliver the knowledge to those who can use and exploitation is planning the use the, of the research after the project is over so you create a company you create another research project whatever it is but all these things have to fit together and this is how you these are boxes you have to tick and how does it fit with all these grassroots initiatives whether you, you you want to connect with a very popular youtube channels or a popular podcast or take part in science cafes science festival how do you connect all of that it's it's quite tricky there is an opportunity though to, to connect them because all these things they can in theory contribute to better communicating they can facilitate the stakeholder engagement you know if you go to a festival you, you can engage people you can even use people in festivals as focus focus group to, to co-develop strategies for uh, you know completing your research or um, uh, it could also be uh, citizen science uh, projects it fits into the stakeholder engagement uh, scheme the problem is you always have some barriers to achieving this connection uh, either well often the timing is not right you know if i have a podcast i have my planning for the podcast which is not the same as your planning for your project maybe you don't have any budget for this so you don't want to send any of your staff to take part of any of these activities or you have no experience in public speaking or the topic is too niche and, and frankly you feel it's going to be too boring for for people to listen to it so all of these are barriers and these are barriers that we think is important to, to overcome. So with Beyond Research, we try to overcome them ourselves by participating into project, but you can also do it yourself. So I'm not here selling Beyond Research. I'm, I'm trying to tell you what, you know, the tips and, and some, some ideas of how you can go around these um, obstacles to, to achieve good synergy. So the first thing is to plan ahead. When you apply for a project, uh, try to have in your consortium uh, the people who, who will be organizing maybe the festival or uh, people who are organizing a podcast, uh, try to have um, science communication expert already from the beginning. Um, get your outreach department involved when you write your application so that all of this is taken into account from the very beginning. For example, if you do an application, you can mention the podcast, you can mention Pint of Science, you can mention uh, anything you want. You, you put it there. And by doing so, it means that you can actually deliver it afterwards when you have the project. You have the budget for it. You can justify spending time on it. And it, it makes your life much, much easier. So don't keep it as an afterthought uh, of a project. It, it has to be in your head when you apply for something. Then when the project runs, think strategically. Before you do anything, the, the, the thing that I always do when I'm in a European project is uh, sit down and in, ask all the partners to tell me exactly what is going to go out of come out of the project. So what are the results? And you need to make some sort of register of it. So what comes out? Who is supposed to be interested in that? And then from there, you, you can determine what is the best way to bring this information to these people. Uh, it seems easy, but often it's overlooked because people tend to focus a lot more on the research and not really on how to manage the research afterwards. It's, it's, it's a specific job. Um, also, strategically get in touch with the people organizing podcast festival, whatever you want, um, early on so that you can plan well ahead and you know what they have in the pipeline and you, you can see yourself whether you can fit or not in their plan. Um, a third point I would say is to build capacity. So uh, it can also be part of projects, and I, I used to insert budget to train internally the partner for, partners of a given project to get the training on public speaking, social media communication, storytelling, uh, how to make use of gamif gamification, all these things that are not, uh, uh, you, you don't learn about it at university when you get your, your PhD. Um, also, it's important to identify talents in your organization. So if you know someone who can sing, who can draw, uh, it's good to get them on board in your team. Uh, the fourth point is to be flexible because all these initiatives, especially when they are grassroots and, and based on the volunteer organization, uh, you know, you, you, you can't just have a pipeline for three years and know what's going to happen. You have to be ready to, uh, to jump on the train at short notice uh, and you have to accept to, to dump it down, meaning that you have to accept that your research, even though you've spent years on it, you have to make it understandable in one sentence, even if you're going to you know, cut a lot of interesting bits of it, you have to, to accept 
that you have to dump it down. You also have to accept that it sometimes is better to ask a colleague to do such work for 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 you for for you, and not always count on the lead researcher to do this work. Sometimes you just go to a student, and it's going to be much better as co at communicating than you. Uh, and finally, don't forget to measure everything you do. Otherwise, it's a bit pointless. You know, if if you count on the um, if you count on capitalizing on on these existing communities of uh, of people following all these festivals, you have to be able to capture the figures behind. So, how many people you can reach out with this, and how many events uh, you have participated into as part of Pint of Science in how many cities? All of this, uh, it's important to to keep track of so that you can report on it afterwards and show that it it was actually useful. To plan from the beginning and so maybe next time for your next project it's easier to justify budget for that um, so that's an example that i think can also work in national project and i'm at the end of my presentation um, these are my contact details i forgot to put lod's but uh, i'm sure we can share that afterward and yeah it's fine <laughs>